And I would like to welcome Dale Sharon. She's a, for the people who haven't joined us before, she's a 25 year docent at the St. Louis Art Museum, a SLAM board of trustee member and an exhibited artist. Today, she's gonna to be continuing her very popular talk series on love, passion, and art, highlighting captivating love stories from works in the St. Louis Art Museum. Please join us today for this, please welcome today for this program. And I also wanted to remind you that there's going to be another program in May 24th of Money and Art, which would be very interesting as well. So please welcome Dale today. Thanks, Dale. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, should we start now? Um, yep. Are we ready? Yep. We're okay. Ready. Do we all have the screen all shared and everything? Looks great. Looks great. Okay. Um, well, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. And I hope you're all well and staying safe. Um, first, on behalf of my computer, um, I must apologize for the technical problems last week. Um, apparently, there was a classified top secret update on my computer, or at least I didn't know anything about it. Um, and that update wouldn't allow my Zoom program to talk or communicate with the one at Miroas. Um, my husband called it Zoom Gate. Um, but I think we have solved the problem and hopefully we're all functioning now. Um, as some brilliant programmer said, live by technology, die by updates. So thank you for your understanding and your flexibility. Um, now back to our unregularly scheduled program. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, sometimes as we've experienced in this past year or even in this past week, uh, you just need to kind of replenish your stores of good feelings. Um, sometimes we just need a release from everything chaotic and uncertain in our lives. And love stories really supply us with that opportunity. They evoke some of our most powerful emotions. Um, great love stories are works that, that resonate with us all. Throughout art history, the concept of love has attracted artists from all walks of life. Depicted in different kinds of styles and rendered in myriads of me mediums, this amorous concept of love continues to captivate viewers time and time again. While there are countless alluring examples of love in art, I've compiled a third group of pieces from the St. Louis Art Museum's permanent collection. These, I think, kind of stand out from the rest. They're an array of works that reference some of the most engaging and impassioned love stories in art history. So whether highlighting a surreal couple or a glistening gold goddess or even a humorous ceramic, ceramic antic. Um, these masterpieces prove that love and art are a perfect match. In so many cases, we've seen love between two people or in this case, two caterpillars uh, can be a beautiful thing. And it certainly is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, the art we will see today demonstrate the limitless different forms that love can take. Okay, well, well love is a universal theme with elements that everyone can relate to. So cast your eyes over these representations of love, lust, and loss on canvas, in bronze, and on paper as we again begin our journey through some of the best love stories in the St. Louis Art Museum. Our first paintings are of a colonial power couple. John Singleton Copley changed the way art was made in colonial America. He was 
unrivaled, the foremost portrait artist in the colonies. Copley is known for his meticulous attention to details, his precision, his accuracy. I mean, you could almost feel the, the, the silk on, on, um, on his waistcoat and the lace on her dress. The facial expression, the pose, the clothing, all are an affirmation of the wealth and social position of this couple, as well as a confirmation of Copley's talent. So to quote Butch Cassidy, who are these guys? Well, Thaddeus Bird, the subject of the painting on the right, was part of the affluent New England society that Copley so often depicted in his portraits. He and his wife are definitely the colonial power couple. Burr was one of the most distinguished and prosperous gentlemen in the colonies. He was actually a signer of the Declaration of Independence. His wife's father was part of the Boston Tea Party and they were cousins of Aaron Burr. The Hancocks married at their home and everyone in high society visited their house. Um, including people like George Washington. Leaning on a sturdy pedestal, um, as you can see over here as he's leaning on this pedestal, um, it's decorated with an ancient goddess of the harvest, which is a traditional symbol of abundance, kind of goes together. Copley creates the image of a confident and wealthy man. Eunice over here um, is shown with a parrot, now it's kind of difficult to make it out, but the parrot is right here. Um, and it's a sign of the exotic and she wears this luxurious gown, but the gown was probably not hers. and was copied from a magazine. Um, many of the bodies of subjects in their clothing were taken from magazines or prints while the faces are actual portraits of the sitter. So the bodies were actually kind of stock images. And sometimes the head doesn't fit quite right on the body and you can see that in this, in this portrait. She also looks kind of a bit sickly. Um, she looks kind of green around the gills. Um, and I think that's because the flesh tones have faded over the years, leaving an undercoat of green paint um, on, on her. And so she looks kind of green. Copley's portraits capture the couple's self-assurance as a member of the landholding aristocracy, a well-connected, powerful couple in America's history. A love-hate relationship fits this couple's love affair. It's a bit unusual to say the least. When Gustav Mahler, famed composer and conductor died in 1911, his widow, Alma Mahler, eventually turned her attention to the young and highly eccentric painter, Oskar Kokoschka. Kokoschka was a key figure in the development of an expressionistic school of painting, and at the same time was an accomplished dramatist. But he was also volatile and angry and aggressive and violent and the local press called him the wildest beast of all. His paintings frequently prompted the analogy of an X-rated film, and he had the uncanny ability to turn any party or gathering into a massacre. Alma was drawn to Kakachka by his heroic attributes as artist and thinker, and he to her statuesque beauty, her poise, her intelligence. At the same time, their personalities were both too powerful and too alike to make for an enduring harmonious relationship. The painter and the grand dame are said to have loved and hated with epic violence. So here's the story of their turbulent alliance. They first met in 1912 and their unbridled passion was the beginning of an uncontrolled love story that would end just three years later. They lived and traveled together, and he painted her many times. However, Kakachka's emotional outbursts were unpredictable, 
He loved passionately and unconditionally. As alma mater later reflected, the three years with him were a battle of love. Never before have I tasted so much hell and so much paradise. But Gikachka was plagued by obsessive jealousy and things got even more complicated when Alma became pregnant with his child. Her decision to abort caused an irrevocable rift, one from which Kakachka was never able to fully recover. Now, this story gets really weird. He took the blood-soaked cloth she gave him and carried it home. This is my only child and will always be so, he said. Later, he continually carried that soiled piece of cloth with him. Kakachka never overcame his pain at the loss of their child and made it the subject of numerous paintings. Terminally depressed, he volunteered for the front lines in World War I and was seriously wounded in Russia in 1915. Alma inexplicably remarried an old love during this time, Walter Gropius. Now, this part of the story is even more weird. To console himself after the loss of his lover, in deepest desperation, Kakachka ordered a life-size doll from a Munich doll maker. Here's the doll right here. The doll was to resemble Alma in every little detail. He used this fetish doll in several paintings and drawings. Kakachka provoked rumor and scandal as he escorted this doll to the opera, held parties in its honor, and even hired a maid to dress and service it. <sighs> Kakashka writes, after I had drawn it and painted it over and over again, I decided to do away with it. It had managed to cure me completely of my passion. So I gave a big champagne party with chamber music, during which my maid exhibited the doll in all its beautiful clothes for the last time. When dawn broke, I was quite drunk, as was everyone else, and I beheaded it out in the garden and broke a bottle of red wine over its head. Okay, the, the paradox appears to have always been there. Kakachka, ever friendly and warm-hearted on the surface, was seething with turbulent social antagonisms underneath. Charming with a smile, devastating with a pen or brush. Some of his best paintings reflect his turbulent feelings for Alma. This work shows Kakachka painting his own image with his initials and wound from the war on his chest. Here you see, okay, Oscar Kakachka and the wound right there. The female in the background may be Alma Mahler, but most likely is his next love, Alma Kalin. In either case, Kakachka depicts in his paintings the dramatic emotional peaks and valleys of his relationships. Sugar Daddy would be the perfect description for this French lady. Well, think about this. What does the artist tell us about this woman? What is her life like? Well, the, the artist actually gives us um, a lot of clues. During the reign of Louis XIV, where court attendants vied to be present during the king's morning toilette, Images set in the bedroom or boudoir were appropriate for the display of wealth and power and position. The nobility rose late. Women spent most of their day preparing for evening festivities. Women would meet with men in this sort of state of half dress like you see here, and the men would be fully costumed. It was a power thing. The artist would be given the dress for the portrait and the, a model wore it for the tedious sittings. Women only sat personally for the portrait of the face. Nicholas de Largelier, painter of this portrait, assumed prominence at court with a roster of clients that included many wealthy citizens. This woman, whose identity remains unknown, 
presents herself amid objects that enhance her beauty and define her wealth. They also define her taste and her status. This painting is not dated, but the story of her hairdo kind of gives us a clue. Louis and his mistress were on a fox hunt in 1710. And the mistress's hair kept falling in her face. So she took her garter and tied her hair on top of her head. From that time on, every woman in court wore her hair up. So no self-respecting woman in court would have had a portrait made of herself after that date. So this portrait had to have been painted before 1710. The lavish table, the imported Chinese porcelain vase, the lustrous beads in her hair, and the delicate satins and substantial laces of her gown were frequent motifs in large Lier's art and were particularly popular among the moneyed society that employed him. She's represented as Venus at her toilet and might be a mistress or a courtesan as the curtain suggests that there is a bed behind. But perhaps there's another theme here, fading beauty, which might be represented by the wilting flowers that you see right here in the vase. This next story from ancient mythology is about the prize he never can win. According to ancient mythology, the god Apollo insulted Cupid, the god of love. Becoming angry, Cupid shot a golden arrow at Apollo, causing him to fall in love with the nymph Daphne. He then shot Daphne with a leaden arrow so she could never love Apollo back. Poor Apollo, madly in love, he continually chased her as she ran away. Daphne begged help from her father, who turned her into a laurel tree, so she would, she would always be safe from Apollo. Apollo was grief-stricken. Some versions say that when Daphne saw Apollo sad, taking pity on him, she made him a laurel wreath, a circle made of laurel, you know, that, that's worn on, on top of your head. Other accounts state that Apollo made the laurel wreath himself taking from the tree. The laurel tree becomes sacred of Apollo and was used by emperors and for all winners at Olympic games. And great heroes in the years to come would be crowned with laurel leaves. Apollo also vowed that she like him would have eternal youth where her leaves would never turn brown or fall but would always stay lush and green. Some even say that he created this laurel wreath to remind him of the prize he never can win. Still, Apollo loved that laurel with all his heart. Rene Sintenis was a German sculptor known for her small sculptures of athletes and young animals. Her work showcased an interest in movement and form rather than anatomical perfection in small details. And that you can see in this small sculpture as Daphne is transforming into the laurel tree. Sintinus was one of the few women of her time to become a professor at the Prussian Academy, an honor she was stripped of by the Nazi regime in 1934. Managing to survive through the Nazi regime in World War II bombings, she was reinstated as a teacher in Berlin. She won a bronze medal in the art competitions at the Olympic Games. I wonder if she too wore a fitting laurel wreath. This artist was known for his fervent and scandalous affairs. A lot of ladies were charmed by Max Ernst who could hardly be called handsome. Yet there was something intriguing about him. Perhaps it was 
the bizarre inner world, the tension of the images of surrealism, which he splashed on his canvases like this one, or perhaps his free spirit, or perhaps his notorious charisma. All of these fascinated those around him. Charming and intelligent, Max Ernst could fit into any company and didn't shy away from any scandal. One of his first scandals may be alluded to in this painting. A male and female nude are intertwined within a form that kind of looks like a hollowed tree trunk in a bare landscape. Max Ernst painted this image soon after moving to Paris from his native Germany in the early 1920s. He lived in a menage a trois relationship with poet Paul Eluard and their partner Gala, who may be the figures depicted in this work. It's unclear whether the couple is passionately embracing or suffocating in this claustrophobic environment. Um, Eluard and Ernst became each other's source of inspiration. Close relations between Ernst and the Alluards turned into a scandalous love triangle. As the whole of Europe trembled on the brink of war, Peggy Guggenheim, his next affair, set out on her tremendous cultural crusade. She boldly resolved to buy a picture a day. She bought surrealist works by Dali, Cubist works by Brock and Picasso, geometric designs by Mondrian, just to start. Peggy and Max married in 1941, though their relationship only lasted five years. She found a new home for her collection in a mansion on the East River in New York City, where Ernst had a large and comfortable studio. Peggy was one of the richest women in the world who helped many artists fleeing the war and finding themselves in America on a shoestring. Yet despite the creative atmosphere and artistic focus prevailing in their house, the marriage of Peggy and Max was quite short. It was said that Peggy had a thousand lovers in her life. She loved art and men in about equal measure, but she also was turned on by fame. Ask why she loved Max Ernst, the great surrealist painter, she replied, because he is so famous. But his next affair was with Dorothea Tanning, and you can see her down here, love that pose. After they met at a party, Max Ernst passed by her studio to consider her works for his wife's newly opened museum gallery and was enchanted by a self-portrait by Dorothea Tanning. Not only did Dorothea show at the exhibition, which featured only female artists, she also conquered Ernst's heart. Peggy Guggenheim recalled that she always regretted organizing that show as it somehow galvanized Dorothea's and Ernst's love, but it was too late. Ernst divorced Peggy in 1946 to live with Dorothea in Sedona, Arizona. Dorothea's work was overshadowed by his fame and life with Ernst was not an easy one. After a couple of years in Sedona where they started an artist colony, they had to emigrate to France because Ernst was refused American citizenship. Yet despite the up, despite the up and downs of their marriage, they stayed together until his death in 1976. Allegorical portrayal of women during the Gilded Age was the hallmark of this next sculptor, Augustus St. Gaudens. In the decades following the, the US Civil War, American artists consciously allied their own creations with the great traditions of ancient Greece and Rome. Why? Well, it was in order to advance the high aspirations of American culture. This period known as the Gilded Age was also called the American Renaissance. By 1878, the United States was in the minds of many on the verge of becoming the new Athens or a modern Florence. 
this was the perceived artistic potential of the young New World Republic. Art was created in the service of high ideals. And one of the greatest exemplars of the Renaissance spirit in, in America was the sculptor Augustus St. Gallens. He lent his talents to extraordinary civic projects. He collaborated with artists, designers, craftsmen, and architects in the spirit of this new golden age and selected subjects that might ennoble his audience. For this important bronze sculpture, St. Gaudens chose feminine beauty as a symbol of what he considered to be the greatest measure of humankind, our potential for selfless giving to others, or to put it as St. Gaudens did in Latin, our exalted capacity for amor, love, and caritas, charity. The figure of a winged angel is a recurring theme by St. Gaudens. Like many other late 19th century artists, St. Gaudens often modeled angels to symbolize traditional virtues of women. This angelic figure by St. Gaudens has the features of Davida Johnson Clark, who you see on the right. She was St. Gaudens model and mistress since the early 1880s and mother of his illegitimate son. The garland around the angel's waist are fittingly passion flowers. Davida Johnson Clark was also the model of a number of other works, including Diana at the top of the tower of Madison Square Garden. The first, it was the first new statue in New York City and the first electronically lit statue in the world. And as my husband said, St. Gaudens literally put his mistress on a pedestal. <laughs> okay. The next image tells a tale of forbidden love. There's a Roman love story between Emperor Hadrian and his Greek servant Antinous that is this tragic tale of immense love, scandal, sacrifice, and mystery. The scandal was not really about two men having sex. It was about two men having very real feelings for each other. Antinous was Greek and exceptionally beautiful. Emperor Hadrian fell madly in love with him and made no secret of his affections for the young beauty. For a Roman emperor to take a male lover was not a huge deal. It was okay under certain guidelines. As long as there was no real emotion involved, the rest of Roman society could tolerate the affair. Also, as long as the partner was a, was a foreigner, as Antinous the Greek was, then it became even easier to accept. Foreigners were considered like animals, simply not as important as Romans. The love affair continued for years. Hadrian brought his boyfriend to state dinners and royal ceremonies, and they toured the empire together. Now, Hadrian was married to a woman and was expected to father an heir to the Roman throne. Failing to produce a son was one of the biggest mistakes of Hadrian's career. Not getting his wife pregnant let the whole empire down and fanned the flames of gossip about him possibly being a complete homosexual, which would have been totally scandalous. Hadrian really was very talented at keeping the empire together and he spent little time in Rome. And so he managed to escape any real consequences for his love life. The empire basically turned a blind eye to his gay activity. However, in the year 130 AD, Hadrian and Antinous were sailing on the River Nile. Antinous fell into the water and drowned. Now there's several theories as to how this happened. He may have thrown himself into the water to end a relationship that could have ruined his beloved Hadrian's reputation. The longer the affair lasted, the greater the risk of being remembered as a homosexual rather than a great emperor. It could have been that Antinous was drowned on purpose to try and prolong Hadrian's life. It was believed that human sacrifice could extend the life of another. 
It could also have just been a simple case of murder on the Nile for reasons forgotten or unknown, or it might have even just been an accident. Hadrian erected temples to Antonus throughout the empire and founded a city in his honor. Many sculptures, gems, and coins survive, depicting Antinous as a model of youthful beauty. This is one of them. Some stories are totally created in an artist's imagination. This is one of them. What is going on here? Well, you can see two women in bright, fancy dresses toiling in an atmosphere of dense steam clouds in a laundry. Jean-Honoré Fragonard, a favorite artist at the French court, often chose working class people as subjects. Here he captures the demanding physical labor that washing clothes required, most notably in the figure carrying a heavy bundle. The artist makes visible the intense heat of the kettle. Contemporary laundry treatises recommended a 17 hour process with temp temperatures near boiling. However, as you can see, it's not a real commentary on the backbreaking work of, pre of peasants. In the foreground of the painting on the right, children are playing and the laundresses are dressed to the nines not what you would expect in a working laundry. And then there are people on the ground in the foreground doing whatever. Fragonard developed an exuberant and inventive manner as a painter, draftsman, and printmaker. He worked largely for the rich Parisians, including Madame's Pompadour and Du Barry. His paintings reflect the loose morals of 18th century France. Infidelity of both partners was common and mistresses of Louis XV were given royal status. Fragonard became very successful with his erotic paintings. He was ruined after the revolution, but spared the guillotine. After the French revolution, he held administrative positions at the Louvre, but his work had fallen from favor and he died in relative obscurity in 1806. Today, his work is prized as an example of the frivolous and playful style of the 18th century French court. This couple's romance was basically on again, off again. Let's take a look at how Willem de Kooning went from speaking one word of English to becoming a record-setting artist whose works now sell for hundreds of millions of dollars. This abstract expressionist forever changed the era of modern art. He was an artist artist and he was drop dead gorgeous. In 1926, he decided to follow his adventurous spirit and with the help of a friend, he hid himself in the underbelly of an Argentine bound British ship that was set to stop in America. He soon, he soon made his way to New York City. By the early 1940s, de Kooning had befriended contemporaries such as Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko. Together, they called themselves the New York School. Grounded in a fundamental rejection of surrealism and Cubist principles, they avoided painting recognizable forms and they changed the art world. Elaine and Willem de Kooning met in New York in 1938. They were introduced by a friend and it was love at first sight. She was outgoing, flirtatious, free-spirited, talented, a femme, a femme fatale. He was introverted and gloomy, obsessed with his work. At 34, he was a detached, untalkative painter who spent hours at the easel. They couldn't have been more different. She was social, he was antisocial. By, but by all accounts, they fell madly in love. 
1957, the artist separated after too much drinking in too, much affa in, in too many affairs. For both of them, I think, not just one or the other. She even had an affair with a prominent art critic, Harold Rosenberg. In 1976, they got back together and Elaine took it upon herself to manage de, Kooning, de Kooning's studio and help him quit drinking. She was already sober. Though Willem de Kooning was the more famous of the pair, Elaine also had an impressive career that is finally getting the attention it deserves after years in the shadow of Willem. Strikingly, Elaine was commissioned to do a portrait of President Kennedy in 1962. One wonders if she would have not been better known as a painter today if she had kept her maiden name or maybe not have married Willem. At any rate, in the, in the 1980s, Elaine lost one lung to cancer and subsequently suffered from severe emphysema. She died in 1989. Willem de Kooning, stricken with dementia, continued to paint and outlived her for another eight years. This painting in our collection was made during that time. This then is the story of the dynamic 50 year on again, off again, open marriage of two painters whose lives were at the epicenter of the post-war art world. This next image tells a tale of triumph over evil. The Osiris myth is the most elaborate and influential story in ancient Egyptian mythology. It concerns the murder of the god Osiris, the primeval king of Egypt and its consequences. The story begins in Egyptian mythology when Osiris, seen here in this sculpture, reigned on earth as the most successful king in Egypt. His queen is his sister, Isis. Their mission was to bring civilization to humanity, to teach people about the practice of religion and marriage. She and Osiris were devoted to each other. One day, disaster struck. Set, the evil one, their brother, envied Osiris and hated Isis. The more the people loved and praised Osiris, the more Set hated him. And the more good he did and the happier mankind became, the stronger grew Seth's desire to kill his brother and rule in his place. So Seth murdered his brother Osiris at a banquet when Set invited guests to lie down in a coffin he had made for the king. Several guests tried unsuccessfully. When Osiris climbed in, Set and his cons conspirators nailed down the lid, weighed down the coffin, and threw it in the Nile. Isis, greatly distraught, finds the body of Osiris and hides it in the reeds where Set eventually finds it and dismembers the body into 14 parts that he scatters throughout Egypt. Isis magically retrieves and joins the fragmented pieces of Osiris then brief, briefly revives him. She anointed his body with precious oils and performed the rites of embalming for the first time. So we always see images of Osiris wrapped like a mummy from the waist down. You can, you can see that here in the sculpture. Isis restored Osiris to eternal life. This spell gives her time to become pregnant by Osiris and she later gives birth to Horus. Since Horus was born after Osiris's resurrection, he became thought of as the representation of new beginnings and eventually he vanquished the murderer, Set. Osiris went on to become judge in the afterworld, ensuring the well being of the deceased. The myth, with its complex symbolism, is integral to ancient Egyptian conceptions of kingship and succession, conflict between order and disorder, and especially life and afterlife. It's a story of devotion and courage and love and the hope of a new life after death. Love outside the lines would fit the new art created by these two American legends.
The relationship between Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns was one of the greatest love stories in modern art. The two were lovers and partners advising and influencing each other as they created a new and exciting art movement. Together, they plotted the downfall of hipster expressionism in their grubby paint-strewn apartments in downtown New York. In the 1950s, during the six years they were together, practically everything they produced was a masterpiece. Just think of Rauschenberg's combines and Jasper John's flags and targets, and you can see them standing next to those in these photos. Both artists were part of that watershed moment in contemporary art, a shift away from the kind of high-minded abstract expressionism toward a much more popular and accessible pop art. What Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg achieved together was pure creativity and originality. They turned banal everyday objects into symbols of our time. The two would soon reorient the direction of contemporary art, but they had humble beginnings. Shortly after meeting him, Rauschenberg enlisted John's help in, um, in his own day job, designing, designing window displays for the Bonwit Teller department store. The following year, the two moved their studios into the same building. But had it not been for the older Rauschenberg, Johns would never have picked a paintbrush, let alone be signed up by Leo Castelli, who at that time was the world's biggest art dealer. The story goes that in 1958, Castelli was visiting Rauschenberg to discuss a planned exhibition, but by a fortuitous turn of events, found himself in John's flat directly below. There he discovered a room full of paintings, flags and targets, an entirely new pictorial language that turned symbols into abstractions. That was the beginning. John said he would show with Castelli for the next 40 years. While each artist possessed a wildly different aesthetic, what remained constant was the shared idea that everyday objects could actually take on artistic meaning. They shared ideas and motifs and materials and ended up carving a path for much of the art that has emerged in the 60 years since. Soon, of course, they would be turning Jasper Johns into America's most successful living artist. In the years that followed, Johns' career thrived, but Rauschenberg's career waned and for a time faltered. By the beginning of the 60s, their relationship was in tatters. Their professional aesthetic and romantic conflicts utterly irreconcilable. The breakup was bitter and they didn't speak for years. In stark contrast to the shy and retreating figure of Johns, Rauschenberg was a kind of pulsating, gregarious figure. Rauschenberg's spontaneous, excited energy collided with the intellectual and deliberate style of Johns, who is said to have been, who, who spoke like Cary Grant. I'd like to have heard that. Although their differing personas may have been incendiary and private, they brought out the best of each other in the studio. Nothing could compare to their early years of creation when the two artists broke down the lines separating mass culture and fine art. They paved the way for pop art and changed Western art history forever. John's artwork especially were seemingly sprinkled with angel dust. The world loved them. In, in 2014, a flag painting sold for $36 million at a Sotheby's auction. The high cost of love works well with this famous print. The intersection of commerce with the seamy side of love inspired the secular Durer engraving. The title refers to the difference in age between the two would-be lovers, an ill-sorted couple. In this popular Renaissance genre, 
lecherous old men attempted to grope beautiful courtesans who hold out for more money or steal the rest of their conquest's belongings. Love is unoffered to the highest bidder in a mercenary transaction that is anything but courtly. It definitely illustrates the high cost of love. It is one of Durer's, what he called moralizing prints that were extremely popular with the masses. Durer was a painter, printmaker, and theorist of the German Renaissance. Born in Nuremberg, Durer established his reputation and influence across Europe when he was still in his 20s. And that was because of the high quality of his woodcut prints. He was patronized by emperors and kings, and he was affluent during his time. Technically, Durer's prints are exemplary for their detail and precision. The son of a goldsmith, Durer was trained as a metal, as a metal worker at a young age. He applied the same um, kind of meticulous, uh, exacting methods required in this delicate work to woodcuts that he had applied to his engraving, engravings. He freed the woodcut from what he called the service of book illustration or from the kind of common handicraft. And he gave it um, a rank of a separate work of art, which could be placed side by side with a painted picture. Durer's innovative and, and powerful prints range from religious and mythological scenes to maps and exotic animals, to books that included many of his prints. By the time he was 30, Durer had become the most famous Renaissance printmaker in Europe. Humorously, he had three assistants who were all named Hans. In 1494, Agnes Fry married Albert Durer, who was forced to stop his grand tour of Europe by his parents in order to marry her. According to the family chronicle, she had a huge dowry of 200 guilders. Their marriage remained childless and was not a generally happy one, as indicated by the letters of Albert Durer, in which he quipped an extremely rough tone about his wife. He called her an old crow and made other vulgar remarks. She was said to be a miserly shrew with a bitter tongue who helped cause Durer's death at a young age. But in reality, he suffered from a continuing fever that he developed in the Netherlands, and he died at age 56. After Durer's death, Agnes Durer, the sole heir, continued to sell his works. As a painter and engraver, Durer was a master in the highest sense. He carried engraving to a perfection never since surpassed. He stands unrivaled. A lifelong partnership describes this couple's marriage. This watercolor is a superb example of the early work of the American Impressionist child Hassan. It's a portrait of his soon to be wife Kathleen or Maud as she was called, sewing in bed. Maud lived in Hassan's hometown in Massachusetts and was a family friend. He painted this watercolor of her a year before their marriage, when he was only 24 years old. He creates a warm and intimate portrait of his future wife. Child Assam, a pioneer American Impressionist, perhaps his most devoted, prolific, and successful practitioner, was born into a family descended from settlers of Massachusetts Bay Colony. He grew up in a well-to-do family before his father lost his business in a fire. Trained as a draftsman at a wood engraving shop, Assam opened his own commercial illustration company in 1881. He began painting American scenes with the pastel palette and broken brushstroke of the French Impressionists. Of the American artists called Impressionists, Child Assam was among those whose work most closely followed that of their French colleagues. In February 1884, after a courtship of several years, Hassam and Maud married. Throughout their life together, she ran the household, 
arranged travel, and attended other domestic tasks. This watercolor is charming and engaging, and the appealing portrait suggests the fondness that Hassam was said to have had for his wife. Child Hassam continued to use Maud as a model throughout his career, and all are sweet and loving images. In this print on the right, he continues to depict these soft and affectionate portrayals even after 35 years. Hassam produced over 3,000 paintings, oils, watercolors, etchings, and lithographs over the course of his career. And with his wife by his side, was an influential American artist of the early 20th century. Now this is a story of triumph over obstacles in many, many hurdles. This subject of this sculpture is most probably Hercules. Everybody has heard of this mythical character, but what exactly is his story? Well, Hercules' father, Zeus, was known to slip out of his house on Mount Olympus in order to seduce nymphs and mortal women with or without their consent. Um, and not surprisingly, Hera, Zeus's wife, queen of the gods, was jealous and vengeful toward her husband's many mistresses and illegitimate children. But Zeus really didn't care, so he kept stepping out on Hera, and Hera kept exacting revenge on Zeus's conquests. On one such occasion, the object of Zeus's affection was a mortal woman named Alchemy. Zeus used his power to disguise himself as Alchemy's husband, which was kind of extra level creepy. Unable to spot the imposter, Alchemy welcomed the king of gods into her bed. And that night she got pregnant and later gave birth to a son named Hercules, which means glorious gift of Hera in Greek. When Hera discovered her husband's secret affair had bred a child, she was overcome with jealousy, rage, and hate. Determined to kill Zeus's illegitimate son, Hercules, Hera sent two snakes to strangle the baby in his sleep. Luckily for Hercules, having Zeus as a father meant he was a demigod, unusually strong and fearless. He grabbed each snake by the neck and strangled them just before they were able to strike. This is where our sculpture enters the story. This sculpture's sturdy figure, solid stance, and mature face are at odds with the idea of a helpless, innocent child. This sculpture seems somehow somehow supernatural and suggests a mythological figure rather than an anonymous depiction of a little baby. With the arms, without any arms or any characteristic attributes, it's impossible to securely identify who this sculpture represents, but we think it is Hercules. And if he had arms, he, it, he would have held two silver snakes. Without any more major interference from Hera, Hercules grew into a great warrior. He married and had three strong sons. The family lived happily together. However, it wasn't happily ever after. It turns out jealous Greek gods don't let go of grudges too easily. Determined to make him suffer, Hera once again interfered in Hercules' life. Hera used her power to get inside Hercules' head. He fell into madness and went insane with rage. Under Hera's dark influence, he gruesomely murdered his beloved wife and children. It doesn't get any more vengeful than that. Even worse, Hercules had no idea that he'd murdered his wife and children because of Hera's trickery. When he came to, he was totally destroyed by his actions. With a broken heart, he set out to seek punishment for the horrifying crimes he had committed. But that's, that's another story. Finally, Hercules was welcomed home and allowed to spend eternity among the gods on Mount Olympus. I just love Greek mythology. <laughs> Great stories. All right, back to reality. Um, a match made in heaven might be the headlines for this famous couple.
they seemed like the perfect couple, Helen Frankenthaler and Robert Motherwell. Both were popular painters and both came from wealthy families. But there's definitely more to this story than just your typical romance when it comes to Robert Motherwell and Helen Frankenthaler. Motherwell was born in 1915 in Aberdeen, Washington. He's best known as one of the founders of abstract expressionism and for his unique painting style. During the 1950s, Motherwell painted his monumental series, Elegies to the Spanish Republic, of which Catalonia is um, one example. Motherwell was outraged by the Spanish Civil War of the 1930s but was not interested in merely illustrating the war. Instead, he used these kind of black organic forms trapped between these massive bars to kind of create the feeling of containment and tragedy that, that pervaded the times. He was incredibly prolific and his works didn't follow any one style. Often, it's difficult to identify a mother well. His many styles are so unique and dissimilar. Born in 1928, Helen Frankenthaler is one of the most renowned female artists in America. She was part of the abstract expressionist movement, kind of a second generation. She was born into a wealthy Manhattan family, which enabled her to study art from a young age. Growing up on Manhattan's Upper East Side, Frankenthaler absorbed the privileged background of a cultured and progressive Jewish intellectual family. Her father was Alfred, Alfred Frankenthaler, a, respect, a respected uh, New York State Supreme Court judge. Their frequent vacations throughout her childhood allowed her to develop a fondness for nature and a love of the ocean. That would definitely be inspirations later in her work. I think you can see a little bit of that there. She was the creator of the soak stain process, inspired by Jackson Pollock's technique of working directly on the floor. Frankenthaler poured washes of thin paint directly under raw and stretched canvas. The resulting forms are carefully controlled areas of color that kind of flood across the whole canvas, as you see there. Motherwell, 42 when their romance began, was the youngest of the first generation abstract expressionists, but was one of the most distinguished. He was known as a writer, as a painter. He really was a genius and someone whose work in mind Frankenthaler admired. Frankenthaler, who had just turned 21, was a rising star whose work was increasingly attracting attention and even beginning to influence older artists. Despite the obvious differences in their work, I mean, the, you can't, these two are really different, um, and the way they made their work, the two painters shared fundamental convictions that the painter's role was to reveal the unseen, not to report on the visible the gesture and color were potent carriers of emotion. It was like a meeting of two brilliant minds. Despite an age difference of over 13 years, Frankenthaler Motherwell started an intense and brief courtship in 58 and married the same year. They continued to travel, they threw lavish parties with their friends and they raised two daughters. The two worked side by side during the duration of their marriage. Later in life, Frankenthaler was asked what period of time she would most like to revisit. Her answer, the first few years with Bob. In 1971, Motherwell and Frankenthaler divorced after 13 years of marriage. Both remarried, continued to paint and became faculty members at different prestigious schools. Motherwell died in 91, Frankenthaler in 2011. So even marriages seemingly made in heaven like this one can have an expiration date, but their work made in during the 13 productive years that Frankenthaler and Motherwell spent together remain masterpieces of the abstract expressionist movement. Humor and elegance fits our last object. 
These ornamental sev vases demonstrate the virtuosity achieved by French designers, modelers, and painters employed by Sev. Sev was the French royal porcelain manufactory. It set the fashion for European porcelain, catering to the luxury trade. The king became its chief client and salesman. Actually, Louis was the principal shareholder along with Madame Pompadour, his mistress. The factory was state property and the manufacture of porcelain was prohibited anywhere else in France. An annual sale of Sev products was held in the king's private dining room at Versailles and courtiers were expected to buy. I mean, you don't say no to a king. It was a sort of forest royal Tupperware party, I suppose. At any rate, Sevwares were painted with the unique colors such as you see here. The blue and gold surface of these ornamental vases exemplify the 18th century taste for gilded decoration and exuberant color. The vase carries a narrative scene which shows a young woman over um, this one over here, which shows a young woman fooling her blind husband as she attempts to sneak her lover out of the basement and away before the spouse discovers her ruse. Well, in the last three months, we have seen nearly four dozen works of art that reflect love and passion in the St. Louis Art Museum. I hope you've enjoyed the art and their stories as much as I have. We all need a bit more love in our lives. There are many, many more love stories connected to great art. And I hope you will see them when you're ready to visit the museum in person. In that regard, I hope to see you soon in the galleries. Again, thank you for joining us and thanks for your flexibility. Let's end with a quote by Chagall. In our life, there is a single color which provides the meaning of life and the meaning of art. It is the color of love. So stay safe and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? We could take a minute just to answer one or two questions if anyone has one. I'm not seeing any. So please join us for the next program from Dale, which will be May the 24th at 10 a.m. And it will be money and art. So. Thank you, Dale. This was another wonderful, wonderful program. And we are looking forward to the next one in May. Well, that, thank you very much. Thanks for having me, everybody. Stay safe. And um, I'm glad we get to go outside now. <laughs> yeah, before it snows. Great. Yeah, right, right. Thanks, everybody. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dale.